mommy, I'm scared. And we're back. The end of a cold, miserable, horrible, disgusting January. To go over three thrilling, nail biting, colourful movies The Grudge, Prodigy, or The Prodigy, and The Lighthouse. And to start with, I'll go over The Grudge, which I saw today. Now, this film was advertised at the view. Well, it wasn't advertised at the view, it said it had a release date on the internet, it was like, oh, it's released on January 24th. And I was like, alright, okay, so maybe it'll have, like, a day before showings on the 23rd. Then I went on the website, they weren't even showing it on the 24th. So I was like, right, okay. So I went on the website and it had been delayed, somehow, till the 31st. Um, but then, after the Friday, so the 24th, I checked and it was up on the view list and it had already been released. So what the fuck's going on? I don't know if it's some sort of marketing issue, or the view'd fucked up, or cinemas had fucked up. It was the same everywhere, because I checked the Odeon, I checked all the other cinemas around about, but nothing, but now it's suddenly all in them. And at the view, it's only got like one or two showings, because it is poorly advertised, poorly received. What's it got? It's got 19% on Rotten Tomatoes, 41% Metacritic. It was announced way back, according to an article I read, one article, Back in uh, 2011, meant to be released for 2013, 2014, and now it's been released in 2020 to nothing. No one cares about it, no one's watched it, no one even knows it's out. Even people have said to me, oh, you don't want to see The Grudge, you know, it'll be a shit horror movie. Nobody cares, nobody wants to see it. No one wants to see it. No fucking surprise. <sighs> um, I don't even know why somebody made a remake of The Grudge. Like, The Grudge, where did they come out? The first one came out in 2004, the second one came out in 2006, and the third one came out in 2009. And like, of these movies, like, I remember there being like, little kind of creepy girl looks like the ring, and uh, fucking Buffy the Vampire Slayer with hands going at the back of her head. <laughs> or a hand or something, that happens in this again. To, uh, what's his name? What's his fucking name? Can I find his name now? Women in Sirius, Friends, Friends, John Cho, that's his name. And it's got him in it, he's the bit that comes at the back of his head, and it's just... Why would you do a remake? Or, sorry, this is a side call, as it goes along with the same things that happen in the previous Grudge movies. But I don't remember the previous Grudge movies. Does anybody? Apart from that one thing, I've seen them all. I don't remember anything that happens in them. Fuck it out. But anyway, it's a side call, so it follows along the stories of the other Grudge movies or something. Um, it's poorly received, terrible reviews, it made, how much did it go? It's got 10 to 14 million budget, on what? I do not know. And it's made 40.3 million as the time I'm doing this. <sighs> Still too much. And I mean, I'm not going to say that they're even going to have to like account for advertising budget, because it's not been advertised anywhere. Maybe a little bit on YouTube, but fucking hell, anyway. So what happens in The Grudge? Uh, the sequel, sidequel, whatever it's called, by director Nicholas Pesce, Pess, who done Eyes of My Mother, which I've not seen and I won't watch. Um, there's like a blonde police officer woman who's got like a terrible actor, Mexican partner, and it follows her, and her husband had cancer, and, and she's got a son, and uh, it's all to do with this, this house, and there's like four different families, and they're all... They're all years in between each other, there's like, oh god, it's all so disjointed and everything, none of it's in chronological order, but the st uh, like her and her police officer friend find this woman um, who you see later on in the film who's dead in the car and then they say that she was, what's her name? Spe she's an exit specialist, you know, she helps people who want to, you know, die and pass on, she helps them get comfortable and then performs assisted suicide, I assume. But you find, they find her in a car, dead, and they're like, oh, she's been here for a month. She's this lady, and then, so you already know that this woman's dead. Then they go further on, then they go back in time to 
different people, and it's got the woman from Insidious in it who's mental, and she does like a peekaboo thing. Ah, peekaboo, she's creepy, she's just peekaboo. She's terrible in this as well. Mrs. Matheson, are you all right? Peekaboo! Who are you playing with? And then there's... So there's... Huck, the woman from Insidious... So I'm trying to confuse myself to try, because I not, wrote their notes for this to try and remember what happened. Uh, it's, oh, there's a woman's in Japan at the start. She gets a, her, her leg attached. She's like, I don't want to be in this house. And she gets her leg like attacked by somebody. Like a, a, the grudge or something. And um, she ends up bringing the grudge back from Japan to this house. And then it's her. That's one part of it. Then there's the woman from Insidious and her husband. And the woman from Insidious is mental. who's wanting to pass on, they live in the house, the main house, the grudge house, in this film. That's another story, so that's two. There's the police officer, blonde haired woman, and her Mexican partner. That's three. And then there's also the Mexican partner years ago with his old partner, who shot himself in the face because of the grudge house. And they're all kind of intertwined and now it makes any sense. And, oh, God. Oh, dearie me. And it's, it was terrible. I'm, I'm trying to find positives. The Mexican guy's terrible, the blonde haired woman's terrible, um, the grudge thing kind of makes a stupid noise when you know it's near, and it's also got this bit when, when the grudge thing's near, or there's going to be the grudge lady, or grudge thing, or ghost, or whatever it is, uh, is near, there's like a fly that sort of appears. It's like uh, Jacob Goodnight Kane from fucking Seen Evil, and it kind of goes. Like, you hear that noise, and that's, you know, the grudge lady's there. And fucking hell, I'm trying to think, there's funny bits in it, like, um, the woman from Insidious uh, kills her husband and, like, chops off her fingers. And then she chops off, what? She chops off her fingers because the grudge ladies, I don't know, oh God, I don't, I don't know. My god, I'm trying to think, there's, there's like, there's a bit, there's a spooky bit where like the volunteer woman's in like a file room and like a ghost of a guy comes and like chases her and goes bleh and then she goes back and watches the camera and like another policeman's watching it and then it turns out he's not on the camera and he's like, oh you need to go home and rest, oh you've been at this job too long, oh blah blah blah, go back and it's just non-linear, just shite, but the woman who helps Insidious Woman and her husband this death person, uh, she gets killed in the car at the start, so you know she's gonna die. And then the the uh, blonde-haired police officer woman is essentially the main character, I guess. She's already got files on the Chinese guy. What's his name again? John John something. What's his name? John uh, John Cho, who's in Harold and Kumar, I think. Uh, She's already got a file of him and the other woman from the very start of the film and the woman that dies in the car thing. It's got all their files of them all being dead, so you know they're all going to die anyway. And it's, oh, fucking hell. It was just... The insidious woman falls down a big flight of stairs and cracks her head open and dies. And it's basically, if anybody's in this house, then they're going to get possessed by this grudge monster lady and uh, they're all going to die and that's it. There's nothing, there's no rule, they don't really go and see like a specialist and think, oh, how are we going to get rid of this grudge person? Oh, what are we going to do? Um, nothing really happens. They all just kind of go into this house, and if they go into this house, then they get possessed by... What's she called? Nadine? Medine? Something like that? The little girl's called Nadine, and uh, John Cho's character is him and his wife are estate agents for the house that's the grudge house. And they've also got a baby that's got an illness or something. I don't know, that doesn't really tie into anything, I don't think. And then he uh, sees a little girl at this house that's meant to be of clients of his. But if this sounds confusing for you, like, I, I, I only watched this, like, tonight. And I don't fucking, and I was not, like, drunk or anything. I have, like, clear memory of all of it, and I fucking don't know what happened. <sighs> anyway, so he's, his wife's 
pregnant, there's some of an illness, then he goes back to the stage agent's house because there's him and his wife are a stage agent of the grudge house. Then he sees the little girl and she's got a nosebleed, then he goes in the house, looks after her, and then the little girl goes away, then he gets possessed by the grudge thing, then he goes home and kills his wife and unborn child and then kills himself. That was that plot done, but you already know that's going to happen because she's already got the file of him dying before that happens. And uh, the partner who's... When they're... Oh my god, this is so fucking convoluted and confusing. It's like fucking Bird Box. It's like when they do the bit in Bird Box where it's like they start off with... Um, they start off with the little boy and the little girl in the boat with Sandra Bullock going through it. But then after that's all happened, they go to how it all started. And then you know that she's going to survive the two kids are only going to once be left alive because they're the only ones left at the start. Do things in order, please, movie. And don't make it so fucking confusing. No wonder it's got fucking such shit reviews. Jesus Christ. And this just is all just going to sound like rambling, but this is just what the film's like. It's, I just, I don't, I don't understand why it's, it's notes on everything. What else happened in it? The Grudge House. And uh, the, there's this, the partner of the Mexican guy, who's now in a mental asylum, uh, who's like restrained at a table, who shot himself in the face, who kind of looks like Mason Verger from fucking Hannibal, um, he's like, oh, the grudge, when it, you go in the house, you get killed by the grudge, and then he's like, oh, the grudge is going to get me, oh, no! Uh, but then he doesn't die, and then at the very end of it, um, she, the blonde haired woman somehow goes back into the grudge house, sets fire to the grudge house and there's like a sort of image of her little boy they don't really have her little boy in it enough you would think for like a movie like this they would use the little boy like he's in the trailer uh, where he goes he goes oh count to five and he goes what's happened and then he runs at her we need to leave right now um, which is kind of something else that happens in the prodigy but i'll get to that next which is actually a good film um little boy runs and goes Bleh! and it's the grudge lady but then the little boy's like, Mum, count to count to five. And he's like, or, or what does she say to him? She says, oh, count to five. We need to count to five for me. And then, oh, do you know what our game is? Count to three or count to five or something. And then the little boy doesn't know how to do it because it's not a little boy, it's the ghost girl. And then she throws, she burns the house down with the little ghost girl and runs away. And you think, oh, it's going to be all, everyone's all going to be hunky-dory. And then um, she goes home. And then it's the next day or something, and her little boy's going to school, and she hugs her little boy and says, oh, I love you, blah, blah, blah. And then in the background, her real little boy goes off to go to school, and then it's the grudge and goes, Gah! and then grabs her, and then kills her, and then that's it. A waste of fucking time, a waste of money, a waste of, why Why would you bring back the grudge? Why not just like call it something else, call it the sludge, and just have it, because it's just, it was pish. None of it made any sense. I don't even remember what the old films were like. They were just like crap, pish horror movies for like fucking, what, 15 years ago. Who cares? Why would anybody want to watch this? Why did I watch it? I don't understand the release schedule. It's had no advertisements. It's shit. So I'd rather drink sludge than watch The Grudge. That's funny. Haha. -ha. Um, but yeah, fuck The Grudge. It was pish. Mrs. Matheson, are you all right? Now, we move on to The Prodigy, not the band, um, the 2019 horror movie which came out last March, um, and I was, I, th I think I remember it being advertised and I didn't want to watch it because I was like, that looks like fucking crap, the usual fucking kid spooky, oh he's evil, it's just, just a rip off of the fucking Omen or the Exorcist, it's just a creepy kid, but it was genuinely probably one of the best, creepiest, most suspenseful um, horror movies I've seen in a long, long time. It was like if The Omen and The Exorcist had like fucked and made like a baby in like this day and age and um, they didn't want to get rid of it. It was fucking great. Mommy, what's wrong with me? Miles is having a very difficult time making friends. So, a budget of 6 million, it made 21.2 million at the box office, which, you know, is less than The Grudge, which is a shame. Um, Nicholas McCarthy's director of it, it got 22% Rotten Tomatoes, 40, uh, 45 Metacritic, 
and it stars some blonde woman whose name I didn't write down, who's good as uh, the mum, and the dad's good. All the characters are quite good in it. And its mainstay is Jackson Robert Scott, who's the kid in the movie, who's the, the prodigy. Um, and he is the little boy from It, you know, the little Georgie who gets eaten by Pennywise and his arm going down the drain. It's him, and he's really good in this. He's actually surprisingly good. I hated him in it. But you're not Georgie. But, that's what this came out a few years later. He's honing his acting abilities. Um, but basically, this, what's the plot of it? Uh, at the start of the movie, there's a, like a woman escapes from this like house in the middle of nowhere and runs off, she's only got one hand, and runs off into traffic and gets like picked up by this woman. And at the same time, the blonde haired woman is like giving birth to, like she's in the hospital about to give birth, and then this guy who's in the house that the woman escaped from finds out that she's broken out, he's obviously been keeping her held hostage, and starts screaming and then like runs after her. And uh, he gets shot by police and he's got like her hand, he keeps her hand. Um, he's cut off all of her hands and he keeps her hand held and he gets shot to death by police and he's lying there like covered in blood. And then as the baby comes out of her, the baby's like lying there like with bits of blood in it in the same positions that the blood was on him. And you're like, oh this is quite interesting, what's all this got to do with? But it's basically this, uh, this boy, uh, the prodigy, who's called Miles, um, he's, he's a special kid, he's got gifts, he's got um, he's smarter than all the other kids, but he doesn't play well with the other kids. You know, he's, he's developing a lot faster um, than he should be for his age, and I think, oh, he's, we've got a special child and blah, 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 but it turns out that he's um, essentially being possessed, or his soul's being overtaken by the soul of the guy that dies at the start of the movie. And throughout the film, Miles gets exceptionally more creepy and weird and um, he's got two different coloured like eyes, like one's green and one's blue and that's the same eyes as on the killer. What's the killer's name? Edward Sarka. Edward Sarka's the name of the killer. But anyway, so he's been, his soul has been taken over by the hand murderers. Um, soul and hand murderer wants to basically come back and use this little boy, I don't know why he's using this little boy, it's not important, but he's trying to use this little boy so that he can take over the little boy's soul and become reincarnated as the little boy and go after this woman and finally kill her and take her last hand. Um, but at the same time, Miles is like still in sort of control of his body, he doesn't really know what he's doing, but there's loads and loads of creepy bits in it. It's fucking really good, like he I kills a spider at the start, he sees like a high. spider in the window, crushes it, he's special. he plays hide and seek with his babysitter, there's another creepy bit, she's like, Right, so I count down for ten, she goes nine, ten, she opens her eyes and he's like standing like right in front of her, like she's not, he's not went hid yet. And so like, oh, do you want more time? And then he goes and hides and he opens up the attic door and I think he like, you don't see him do this, but he leaves like a broken beer bottle on the floor and she stands in it and like falls down the stairs and gets a big hole in her foot. Uh, this is other weird creepy shit that he does. Um, he speaks in like a weird voice because I think it's, um, the f the mother and father of, again I need to find his name, of that Sarka, the real killer, are from Hungary and then they moved to America. So but he's, so Miles is sitting there speaking in like Hungarian and his mum like records him on a tape recorder and then gives it to the psychiatrist and this is how she ends up meeting um, with Arthur Jacobson who's another good actor who's like the spiritualist, hypnotist, demonology person. You must be Miles. Miles is dangerous. I don't feel safe with him in the house. And uh, they basically tell her on the tape that he's been in his sleep speaking in Hungarian, a language that barely anyone, like, only a small section, only a, a, a part of Hungarian, only a small number of Hungarian people speak near the border of some other country. Oh, it was really, really, ah. Uh, it's good. It's really, really good. When I started watching it, I said, like, this is going to be crap, but I really fucking enjoyed it. Anyway, more creepy stuff. Um, I was speaking of, he attacks a kid with like a wrench at his like special school that he's at. And um, he also like sort of, they're like, oh, why are you doing this? And then he's basically saying that like somebody's like hurting him. Somebody's like hurting me, but I can't tell you who's hurting me. And he, he's like, 
he's basically saying it's the person in his head who's the murderer, but he's insinuating as the murderer that it's his dad that's been abusing him. Basically, it's really good. Oh, another fucking creepy bit as well. There's a bit where he's sitting there with like a Rubik's cube, and uh, his mum like turns around to speak to the dog, and he turns around and he turns around. And he's got like a really weird, like fucking like creepy face. I can absolutely fucking shat myself. Then it's the PJs, okay? Tallulah. Get. What did you say, mommy? And uh, there's another bit where it's kind of like in the same as The Grudge, but it's done like a far, far superior level is where um, this is in the mother's dream sequence. I don't really dream sequences. This was all right. He's like standing at the end of the hall and he's like, Mom, I'm scared of a bad dream. She's like, oh, come here, come here. And he runs at her. But through the shadow, he like turns into like the killer, like an actual full grown man and like chokes her and then she wakes up. Oh, it's really fucking good. Mommy, I'm scared. Come here, baby. Come here. <laughs> and uh, he also like films his mum and dad arguing and then gives his dad shit in the car because like because um the dad and the mum were having an argument and he was basically saying, Oh, he's, I would never hit my little boy, my dad was abusive, I would never do that. And then the little boy says that to his dad and he's like, How the fuck could you know about my dad when I never said that in front of you? And you find out he's been like filming. He's somehow managed to construct like a little camera thing. He's been filming them talk. And then, what else happens? When he speaks to Arthur Jackson, Arthur Jackson kind of like hypnotizes him. And he's like, I want to speak to the real, like, he doesn't know he's the murderer at this point, so I want to speak to him. And uh, the murderer, well, Miles, in Miles' body, the murderer basically says, he's like, I've taken drugs from your medicine cabinet, and um, what, what's my mum going to say if she finds me in here asleep, and I say that you had your cock in my mouth, or something like that, and he basically says, and there's drugs in my system, and um, I also got pubic hairs from your toilet bowl and my teeth, and he sort of grits his teeth, but it's like the teeth of, like, the old man, like, the murderer, oh, it's brilliant, and the guy's like, oh, fuck, he's mental. Cock in my mouth. Then the police find drugs in my blood, the same drugs from your medicine cabinet. Not to mention the pubic hairs with your DNA that I found on the rim of your toilet and placed in my teeth. But, um, as the film progresses on, basically, Miles is mad, he ends up killing the family dog, and then because he's got a thing in my hands, he cuts off the dog's paw, and um, there's like flies at one point, and the mum, this is after the dream sequence bit, mum goes and finds the dog, and they're like, why did you fucking kill the dog, why did you do this, and they're going to take him to like some sort of like specialist person, and um, he ends up like putting his dad like in a coma in the car, because he's like, he's like, right, we can't have him in the house, it's too dangerous to have him in the house, um, we're going to have to take him to the specialist, and he's with his dad, he like cuts his dad's seatbelt, and his dad like turns around and he fucking stabs him with these shears. I don't know how he managed to get these shears in the car, mind you. That's a nitpick, I guess. And then his mum finds the drawings. By this point, Arthur Jackson's already told the mum about the uh, Edward Sarkin, and how he's got the different coloured eyes. And they find out that like the day he was apprehended and shot by police was the same day that um, the son was born. And it was the same time, it was like 10 minutes after he died, that the son was then born. Like, oh my god, he's possessed his soul, oh no! And she finds in a little bit underneath his, like, chest of drawers and his cupboard in his room that uh, Miles has been, like, drawing hands and collecting clippings from the woman that escaped at the start of the film, who's now wrote a book about the hands of death or something like that. And uh, so he's like, oh, that's why he's back, he's got a purpose, he's back to try and find that woman. And so, to try and save her son, she drugs him, she drugs Miles, this is after the dad's been in a, the dad's in a coma in hospital, she drugs Miles, and um, she's like, right, I'm going to take you, she takes Miles to the woman, finds her, takes her to her, and is like, going to shoot the woman for her, but she can't bring herself to do it, and then Miles comes in, kills the woman, finally kills her, and says, ah, you shouldn't have left me, Margaret, I think her name's Margaret, what's her name? I wrote it down, what's her fucking name? I can't fucking remember what her name is. What the fuck is it? Margaret! And um, he kills her. He's, he's, he's in a sort of trance. You think, you think oh, is, is Miles back? Oh, is he back? 
and he walks out into the woods and basically tells his mum that Miles has been dead for a long time and when he said in bed after the dream sequence bit he's like I'll always love you Miles that when he said that to her that was the last time that Miles was alive and so she's like right you little cunt um, I'm gonna shoot you in the head because you still got the gun because you're not gonna have my son's body even though you've got his soul you little cunt and then um, she goes to shoot him a gunshot goes off but lo and behold you will not You cannot have his body! Like at the end of The Omen, where he goes to kill the child, um, a farmer shoots her and then like takes Miles back. <laughs> she was trying to kill me. And then at the very end of the film, um, fucking, there's like a foster family that's taken in Miles, and he does this little, really creepy smell. They're like, oh, Miles, would you like to come in and see your room? She puts her hands out to him, and he still looks at her hands and goes, oh. well, he doesn't really go like that, because, like, he, he, he laughs, but, like, internally. And uh, he goes into the room, into his bedroom, and it's got Miles written on his wall, and it's all nice, big new bedroom. And uh, they're like, oh, we're going to look after you while your dad's still in the hospital. So his dad's still not dead yet. And then uh, he turns around and he's got like sort of mirrored, like, walking wardrobe. And then it shows you, like, the killer. What's his name? I keep forgetting his fucking name. Uh, Scar? Scark? Scar? Whatever his name is, the murderer is standing in the mirror and they look at each other. And he's like, yeah, and the murderer sort of smiles. And you're like, aha, he's good ending. A bleak, worrying ending. Like the omen. Brilliant. Brilliant. Loved it. I would highly recommend going out of your way, it's on Netflix, uh, to watch The Prodigy. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I would drink it fucking bone dry and then cut its hands off and fucking eat them and all. I wouldn't eat the fingers for the women in the grudge though, but I'd eat the hands off The Prodigy, if that makes any sense. Aye. He's so different now. I feel like I don't know him. Mommy? Will you always love me? No matter what I do. It's now Friday, 31st of January, and I am back from an undisclosed location. Not the view. The view's not snobby enough for such a film of such a caliber. I'm only joking. Uh, and I went and saw The Lighthouse, which for some reason came out in fucking October in America, like last year or something. And it only just came out today in the UK. Um, which is great, because it's 2020 and that's just what happens. Why the fuck's that? Just bring all your films at the same fucking time. Tell me. What's a timberman want with being a wiki? Just looking to earn a living. It's like any man. Starting new. On the run. Keeping secrets, are you? No, sir. Why don't you spill your beans? <laughs> by Robert Eggers, um, who also did The Vivitch, or The Witch, with uh, Anna Taylor-Joy, and that's another film that's fucking fantastic. Fantastic cast, dialogue, acting, set design, sound design, much like this film, but I would say this film's even better. It stars uh, Robert Eggers, not fucking Robert Eggers, what's his name? Willem Dafoe, who's the Green Goblin. Uh, in a load of fucking 4,000 other films. It also stars Robert Pattinson from The Twilights. Um, Patterson? Pattinson? Pat McGroy? Pattinson, I think it is. And um, it's them two together. Basically, Robert Pattinson goes to this little small island that's got a lighthouse to work for four weeks with Willem Dafoe. And it's just a sort of them two alone on a little island at a lighthouse 
and it's fucking fantastic. It's just the way the dialogue from them to the monologues from Willem Dafoe, the the language that he, he speaks, just the acting, everything's just crisp and it's all filmed in black and white, just like this video. You know, because I'm creative and clever, you see. And it was just maybe maybe the best film I've seen in like the last two years since um, Possum in the House that Jack built, and I will get to them at some point as well. But uh, it's by A24 Studios as well, who did the Vivitch, they did a ghost story, they've done fucking loads and loads of shit. I can't really think of a bad film they've done. Um, but yeah, so it's got a budget of 4 million, box office 14.2 million, I don't think this film will make that much money. Um, it's it's too it's too smart and sophisticated for the common knuckle draggers to go and watch. Um, but ba yeah, so basically, Robert Patterson goes there, he's got a job for four weeks. He's the little shit monkey who has to do all the fucking work. Willem Dafoe is his boss and sort of treats him like a cunt, but then they eventually get to become sort of not friends, but they eventually get to chat and uh, lots and lots and lots and lots and gallons and gallons of alcohol is consumed um, by the both of them. And they both spill their beans, which is a tagline for this film. Why just spill your beans? <laughs> uh, about their lives, about everything, about why uh, Robert Patterson's character's there, who's called Winslow. But he's not really called Winslow. He's called Thomas. And uh, well, the first character is called Thomas as well. And I wrote down some notes for this because. I can't. I won't be able to do like a full review of it because there's just it, it was. It's too good. Basically, go and fucking see it. No matter what, however you can, go and fucking see it. It's so fucking good. Uh, I've got Wiki down, so we've got not Wikipedia, not WikiLeaks. That's what Lighthouse Keeper is. He's a Wiki, so that's what they both are. Um, there's like ugh, there's the things that Willem Dafoe says. Like I, I can't just remember. There's a bit where he's trying to like make him like him and Robert Patterson give a toast. Robert Patterson doesn't want to have a drink. Then he ends up drinking what he like pours out the drink and gets water for the sink and it's fucking disgusting because the system hasn't been cleaned out yet. And he says something like I wrote it down it's a little vague thing. He's like boredom le turns men to villains and the only medicine is drink. And uh, here here on this channel we wholeheartedly agree with that sentiment. Woohoo! Boredom makes men to villains and the water goes quick, lad. Vanished. The only medicine. Is drink. Keeps them sailors happy, keeps them agreeable, keeps them calm, keeps them stupid. <laughs> a mermaid little figure thing that Robert Patterson like finds in his bed and eventually when he's absolutely paralytic he ends up like wanking over it and stuff when he's wasted and there's like so much of this film it's like you don't really know if the things that are happening are actually happening. Like you don't know. There's a bit where um, Bob the even says it. Like, am I like a fragment of your imagination? Like, is he just made up? Like, is any of this real? Like, is because there's bits where there's like a mermaid that Robert Patterson finds after they've had like the first night of like really really heavy drinking, wakes up hungover and like finds like a mermaid as he's emptying the bed chambers and like shit goes all over his face and that it finds like a mermaid like on the water and you think. So the mermaid's real, and then there's like another bit where um, a lot of the main story of this is to do with the lighthouse, the actual light in the lighthouse, because Robert Pattinson's character um, basically gets all the shit menial jobs. He's the little lackey and the work dog, and then um, Willem Dafoe's the boss and he's in charge of the light, and he doesn't let uh, Robert Pattinson see the light. And there's a bit where he sort of, I think he drags like a big can of oil up, or maybe it's before that, where Willem Dafoe goes up and he sort of sees him lying there like naked from underneath as he sort of locks himself in and he goes up to see the light and he's like lying there naked and he's like speaking to the light and you see like a big octopus like tentacle and like is that real? Are the mermaids real? Is any of this real? Like what's going on? Are they mental? Is Ron Patterson mental? Is he just drunk? Are they both drunk? Well they're all, they're both definitely drunk. Um, Basically, Robert Patterson's character, Winslow, isn't even Winslow. He spills his beans to Willem Dafoe's character, it's called Thomas, uh, Thomas Wake, I wrote him down as, I think that's his name. And uh, spills his beans and basically says that he used to be like a timber man, 
working up somewhere in Canada, and um, he says that he killed this guy called Winslow, and basically because he was like a clean slate, he didn't have like a checker pass like him, this character, who's really called Thomas, confusing myself in my head, um, he stole his identity, and that's how he's managed to get through here, so he killed somebody called Winslow, and he stole his identity. And all, there's also loads of stuff to do with like seagulls in this, and uh, Willem Dafoe says that seagulls are basically just the souls of like dead sailors, and a little seagull like starts tormenting Robert Pattinson, like he's trying to put coal in like the coal shed or whatever, for like the big like foghorn thing for the lighthouse, and um, a little seagull's like in front of him, and he won't move, and then later on like the seagull annoys him, and uh, the big cistern thing that he's got to clean out, um, for the water to like flow into the, um, into the like lighthouse living quarters, but eventually that he finds like a dead seagull's like inside of it and then another seagull lands down and like says to him and Laura Patterson it was the, the funniest moment in the film I'm fucking laughing it's, I don't know if it's meant to be funny or not picks up the seagull and fucking batters it to death smacks its fucking head off this big concrete thing it goes on for like about a minute and a half he's just beating the seagull to death and then basically because of oh my god my cigarettes went out Basically because of that, the winds change at the lighthouse thing. They're only meant to be there for four weeks. The winds change because he killed this seagull and then a big massive storm comes in and when they're meant to get picked up, uh, they get drunk the night before as they get drunk for the entire thing, they're meant to get picked up. They don't get picked up and you don't know if that's because they've slept in because they were drunk or if the ship was never going to pick them up. Or oh, So fucking good. Uh, there's also a lot of references to, um, I'll just I'll basically ruin, there's so much fucking booze in it, they're singing drinking songs and they're dancing about and there's a bit where they're like about to fucking kiss each other and then they're lying on the floor embracing each other and singing and there's a bit where they give each other like, Robert Patterson's character smokes like roll ups and Lauren, uh, Lauren Defoe's character smokes a pipe and then at one point they swap their pipe and their cigarette over when they're drinking because they get a bit more friendly and then they end up falling out and Oh, it's so fucking good. Also, there's a lot of references to uh, Wonderful keeps calling uh, Robert Patterson a dog. I'm not going to just call them both Thomas because it annoy me. Uh, keep calling him a dog, he's like, you filthy dog, and then there's a bit where he keeps calling him a dog and calling him a dog, and eventually towards the end of it, when they've properly fallen out and all hope's lost and all the booze has run out, there's another bit where there's meant the a storm's destroyed and made all the rations in the living quarters ruined, it soiled all the rations, but there's a box of rations buried, like, right at the feet of the lighthouse, and it's not even rations, it's just other fucking bottles of drink. And after they get really, really drunk, he keeps calling him a dog and a dog and a dog. And uh, Robert Patterson eventually ends up snapping and battering him, and then puts him on a lead and makes him bark like a dog. <laughs> Leads him about in a lead, and then puts him in a hole and tries to and basically, essentially, buries him half alive. Oh, fucking great that scene! Bark, I said, bark. <laughs> bark, <laughs> Maddie. <laughs> There's my good lad. There's also a bit where they've, they've run out of all the drink because they've they've exhausted all their drink and they're supposed to pouring fucking bottles of rum or vodka or whatever it is down their throats and they start singing and Robert Patterson's like <laughs> he's just singing and they Okay, Will Defoe's like, he's like, dance, dance, Winslow. 
and he's poured the pour the drinks in their faces and he's fucking going he's like singing a song but he's not even singing words he's just going <laughs> oh it's fucking it's so good it's like dance Winslow dance come on you like the window here how are we going to win that here in the same way just tell me please let's put in a big dog It's such a wonderful, wonderful piece of fucking cinema, honestly. Um, but then there's like bits, obviously, Winslow's... Winslow, Robert Paxton's characters lied, obviously, about being called Winslow and stuff. And um, there's a bit where they're drinking... They're drinking through the whole film, so I don't know why I'm saying that. Um, Willem Dafoe's character says, he's like, Oh, I broke my leg. Something to do with nun, Catholic nuns or something. And then later on... He says that he got scurvy and that's why his legs fuck. Because he's, he's only got like one leg, he's hobbles about, he's got like a peg leg or a bad leg or something. And uh, then uh, Robert Patterson's like, he's like, oh, he's like, are you sure that wasn't about the Catholic nuns and your leg got broken? And then he's like, oh no, I think you must have misheard me. So they're both lying to each other about stuff. But they're trapped in isolation on this island with lots and lots of alcohol and their nerves and their minds are fucking shot. Um, but that's what I'm saying is you don't know if it's drunkenness or hallucinations or madness or a combination of all of them as to why this is all going on. But um, towards the end, oh, there's another bit as well. When um, after um, Willem Dafoe gets, uh, he won't, obviously won't let Rod Patterson get to see the light. So after he's, he's hurt him like a dog and he's, fuck, he's, he's snapped, batters him makes him like a dog in a lead, puts him in a hole and he buries him and that's another great scene. He's got all this mud getting fucking thrown in his face and in his eyes and in his mouth and he's doing like a big long fucking monologue as well. I need to like... The monologues that Willem Dafoe does, there's one as well where like Winslow uh, slags his like cooking. He's like, oh, it's like, I, it's like I hate, he's like, I don't like your fucking lobster or I don't like your cooking or that and he stands up and he just bellows just this amazing like monologue at him like just ridiculing him saying that he hopes his eyes and everything get like just pecked out or ripped out or what and goes to the bottom of the sea and oh, it was great and then he's kind of like after that Robert Patterson Winslow's kind of sitting on the floor he's like ah, I'm only kind of joking about your cooking oh it was awesome it was like a lot of the film's quite funny as well like the like them two are like acting off each other it's, oh, it's so fucking good but it's now itself the sea. All right, have it your way. I like your cooking. And um, there's another bit where, that's what I'm saying, um, when he's in the hole, Robert Patterson's going to go up to the light. He's got the keys. You can finally go up to the light. And he's like, right. But before he does it, he's going to go and have a smoke. There's like a little bag on the table and he's going to have a little fag before he goes up. And uh, at this point, they've run out of alcohol and they're drinking like turpentine or oil or fucking gasoline or something mixed with something. Like they're drinking that to get fucked at their heads because there's no drink left. smoke before I go and see the light and um, as he's doing this Willem Dafoe runs in with an axe and he's like the light's mine and he hits uh, Patterson in the shoulder takes the axe out smacks fucking um, Willem Dafoe in the head with like this turpentine oil canister thing and then hits him in the fucking face or something with the axe and that's him finally dead and then he has a smoke has a little drink of turpentine oil gas or whatever it is goes up to see the light and then this is the very end of the film and uh, you're like you're finally gonna get to see what's in the light it's just all mystical and that and he goes up and it's like even though it's in black and white it's like beautiful beautifully shot you're like oh, it looks so magical and majestic and then uh, the light sort of opens it's little shutters and it stops it opens itself uh, to Robert Patterson and he's sort of looking at it and his face is all covered in like mud and blood and it kind of like fades away as he's looking at it and like he kind of puts his hand in and then like the sound design in this movie is so fucking good 
there's the sound of like the fog horns, like the spinning of the wheels for the, uh, the sort of power like the fog horn of the lighthouse or whatever. It's just, and then it's just the sound of him as his hands in this light, and he's like screaming. But the, the way it's edited, it just sounds so weird and like distorted. like screaming and then he's sort of after it he falls down hey Nelly ah, Nelly loves it as well ah. after that he falls down the little hatch falls all the way down the lighthouse bit and then at the very end of the film for some reason you don't even know if he's even at the same lighthouse because we don't see the lighthouse again hey Nelly come on then He's a good navy. Uh, we don't even see the lighthouse again. He's lying naked on some rocks, sort of shaking, covered in bird shit and blood. And his eyes have been pecked out and he's covered in like seagulls and they're like pecking his like organs and then it ends. And I was just like, oh, superb. It was so, all the drinking, all the chit chat between the two of them, all the bullshit they're giving each other, all the just, dancing and singing and just the mystery and sort of like the weirdness of like mermaids and there's another bit where like you think the last wiki that was there before Robert Patterson's character uh, like Willem Dafoe says like he went mad and like left the island or something and then he sort of like lifts up a lobster cage that might have this wiki's head in it crab coming out of his eye, but you don't know if that's real or if it's not real, and you're like, oh, superb, like a masterclass in fucking cinema. I can't wait for this fucking Robert Eggers to make something else, because it was like, honestly, probably one of the best films I've ever seen. It was so, 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 so good. A fucking country mile away, that's pr how you do proper, suspenseful, gripping, like psychological horror, it was perfect. A far cry from the fucking grudge, which came out basically at the same time, supposedly in the same day, but not really. So, yeah, so to summarise, The Lighthouse is awesome, go out your way to see it, I would, any way, shape or form, go and see The Lighthouse, um, it's fantastic, I would fucking down it until I was fucking sickle for myself, I would drink fucking turpentine out of a fucking seagull's arse just to see this film. It was oh, phenomenal. So good.